Hello, folks. Thank you for joining me for another spooky story. Also, thank you in particular for uh, helping me to try and revive the tradition of ghost stories around the holidays, because I believe the Creepy Christmas playlist is where you will find this, uh, this video. So today I have for you a very, very popular, uh, it's very well known, but nonetheless, it is, it is very, very good. I, I really enjoy it. A uh, story called The Phantom Coach by Amelia Edwards. Now, Amelia Edwards was an English uh, 19th century novelist. Um, she's actually a very interesting woman, uh, apart from being um, a very good a very good writer. Uh, she was a traveler. She traveled throughout the Dolomites in Italy. She became an Egyptologist and traveled quite a bit in Egypt as well. Her books tended to be very well uh, researched. Um, they tended to be set in places that she was familiar with. Um, as far as I know, she also never married, which is interesting for a, a woman of that time. So all in all, just a very, very interesting person. That's kind of cool, this idea of this Victorian adventure lady sort of poking around Egypt with, um, with her entourage. So that's that's kind of cool. I think she's a very interesting person. Um, her books, her stories were popular uh, in their day. People did quite enjoy them. And as I said, the the Phantom Coach is definitely not obscure. I know I've featured sometimes some some quite obscure works on my channel, but this is definitely not one of them. It is very well known. Appears a lot in anthologies, but hey, it's really cool. I like it and it fits our theme and it's my channel. So what I like uh, goes is how, how that works. This is another one that will probably be broken into uh, two halves just because it is, um, it is kind of a little long. So it'll be, as I said, two halves. Before I get into it, I'm going to do uh, the usual disclaimers in that these are uh, Victorian or very early 20th century stories, and as such will often contain things about class, race, gender, religion, orientation, whatever you can think of that may be distasteful to modern ears. And if that's not something that you want to, uh, that you want to encounter, uh, please feel free to, to not consume this content. And the other disclaimer is, of course, the situations that tend to give rise, pardon me, nose ick. Cat hair gets everywhere. Uh, the situations that tend to give rise to horror stories and ghosts and the macabre are things like murders, suicides, unpleasant circumstances generally. And again, if that is distasteful to you, please uh, feel free to not consume this, uh, this content. If you are enjoying this content, however, please uh, like, subscribe, share the video around. It's a great way for people to encounter authors or stories that maybe they aren't familiar with. And as always, if you have a request or just want to talk to me in general, please leave a comment in the section below. I'm um, very open to taking requests for particular stories, as I've said many times. The only real stipulation is, of course, that it's some kind of macabre, scary thing. That's kind of the vibe we're going for here. And uh, that it is in the public domain. Yeah, my getting static between my shawl and my hair. It's kind of cool and damp in here today, but uh, the ring light makes it so warm that I've had to have, like I have windows open just so that I don't overheat. But like, it's one of, you know that thing where like you can't really decide if you're cold or not and you're sort of flip-flapping, flip-flapping, flip-flopping. I also would like to apologize in advance for the misspeakings that I'm bound to do but you flip-flop back and forth, so like sweater on, sweater off, sweater on, sweater off. That's kind of the experience I'm, I'm having right now. Now, with all of that out of the way, I'm going to slide the microphone back just slightly if I can, or slide myself back so that I don't hit it. That looks good. And we will now get into the Phantom Coach 
by Amelia Edwards. Let me come to this side for a change. So the phantom coach. The circumstances I am about to relate to you have truth to recommend them. They happen to myself and my recollection of them is as vivid as if they had taken place only yesterday. Twenty years, however, have gone by since that night. During those twenty years, I have told the story to but one other person. I tell it now with a reluctance which I find it difficult to overcome. All I entreat, meanwhile, is that you will abstain from forcing your own conclusions upon me. I want nothing explained away. I desire no arguments. My mind on this subject is quite made up, and, having the testimony of my own senses to rely upon, I prefer to abide by it. Well, it was just twenty years ago, and within a day or two of the end of the grouse season. I had been out all day with my gun, and had had no sport to speak of. The wind was due east. The month, December, the place, a bleak wide moor in the far north of England. And I had lost my way. It was not a pleasant place in which to lose one's way, with the first feathery flakes of a coming snowstorm just fluttering down upon the heather, and the leaden evening closing in all around. I shaded my eyes with my hand, and stared anxiously into the gathering darkness, where the purple moorland melted into a range of low hills, some ten or twelve miles distant. Not the faintest smoke wreath, not the tiniest cultivated patch or fence or sheep track met my eyes in any direction. Yeah, it sounds like you're really lost. <laughs> Take a compass and a map. Like, there's no, there's no shame in that. It's, it's fine. I... Honestly, I sometimes use the Compass app on my phone. I'll be totally honest. There was nothing for it but to walk on and take my chance of finding what shelter I could by the way. So I shouldered my gun again and pushed warily forward, for I had been on foot since an hour after daybreak and had eaten nothing since breakfast. Meanwhile, the snow began to come down with ominous steadiness and the wind fell. After this, the cold became more intense, and the night came rapidly up. As for me, my prospects darkened with the darkening sky, and my heart grew heavy as I thought of how my wife was already watching for me through the window of our little inn parlor, and thought of all the suffering in store for her throughout this weary night. We had been married four months, and having spent our autumn in the highlands, were now lodging in a remote little village situated just on the verge of the great English moorlands. We were very much in love, well, that's good, and, of course, very happy. This morning, when we parted, she had implored me to return before dusk, and I had promised her that I would. What would I have, what would I have not given to have kept my word? Even now, weary as I was, I felt that with supper, an hour's rest, and a guide, I might still get back to her before mid midnight, if only guide and shelter could be found. I mean, lots of things would be easier with a guide, let's be honest. And all this time, the snow fell and the night thickened. I stopped and shouted every now and then, but my shout seemed only to make the silence deeper. Then a vague sense of uneasiness came upon me, and I began to remember stories of travelers who had walked on and on in the falling snow, until, wearied out, they were fain to lie down and sleep their lives away. Would it be possible, I asked myself, to keep on thus through all the night long? I mean, I wouldn't. Would there not come a time when my limbs must fail and my resolution give way, when I, too, must sleep the sleep of death? Death, I shuddered. How hard to die just now, when life lay so bright before me. How hard for my darling, whose whole loving heart, but that thought was not to be born. To banish it, I shouted again, louder and longer, and then listened eagerly. Was my shout answered, or did I only fancy that I heard a far-off cry? I hallooed again, and again the echo followed. Then a wavering speck of light came, came suddenly out of the dark, shifting, disappearing, growing momentarily nearer and brightening. 
Running towards it at full speed, I found myself, to my great joy, face to face with an old man and a lantern. Thank God, was the exclamation that burst involuntarily from my lips. Blinking and frowning, he lifted his lantern and peered into my face. Okay, so I'm going to attempt the accent. Let me know how it goes down below. I suspect poorly. What for? growled he sulkily. Well, for, for you, I began to fear I should be lost in the snow. Ugh. And folks do get cast away hereabout from time to time. And what's to hinder you from being cast away likewise, if the Lord's so minded? If the Lord is so minded that you and I shall be lost... T pardon me. If the Lord is so minded that you and I shall be lost together, friend, we must submit, I replied. But I don't mean to be lost without you. How far am I now from, from Dwadling? Dwalding? We're going to go with Dwalding for the pronunciation of this town. How far am I now from Dwalding? A good 20 mile, more or less. And the nearest village? The nearest village is Wick. And that's 12 mile to other side. Where do you live, then? Out yonder, said he with a vague jerk of the lantern. You're going home, I suppose. Maybe I am. Then I'm going with you. The old man shook his head and rubbed his nose reflectively with the handle of the lantern. It ain't no use, growled he. He won't let you in, not he. We'll see about that, I replied briskly. Who is he? The master. Who is the master? That's nout to you, was the unceremonious reply. Well, well, you lead the way, and I'll engage that the master shall give me shelter and a supper tonight. You can try him, muttered my reluctant guide, and still shaking his head, he hobbled, gnome-like, away through the falling snow. A large mass loomed up presently out of the darkness, and a huge dog rushed out, barking furiously. Is this the house? I asked. Aye, it's the house. Down by. And he fumbled in his pockets for the key. I drew up close behind him, prepared to lose no chance of entrance, and saw in the little circle of light shed by the lantern that the door was heavily studded with iron nails, like the door of a prison. In another minute he had turned the key, and I had pushed past him into the house. Once inside, I looked round with curiosity and found myself in a great rafted hall which served, apparently, a variety of uses. One end was piled to the roof with corn, like a barn. The other was stored with flour sacks, agricultural implements, casks, and all kinds of miscellaneous lumber, while from the beams overhead hung rows of hams, flitches, and bundles, bundles pardon me, and bunches of dried herbs for winter use. In the center of the floor stood some huge object gauntly dressed in a dingy wrapping cloth and reaching halfway to the rafters. Lifting a corner of this cloth, I saw, to my surprise, a telescope of very considerable size, mounted on a rude, movable platform with four small wheels. The tube was made of painted wood, bound round with bands of metal rudely fashioned. The speculum, so far as I could estimate its size in the dim light, measured at least 15 inches in diameter. As a woman familiar with uh, the other type of speculum, <laughs> while I was yet examining the instrument and asking myself whether it was not the work of some self-taught optician, a bang, ra a, a bang, a bell rang sharply. That's for you, said my guide with a malicious grin. Yonder's his room. Whoop, lost my hood. Pardon me. Let's resituate ourselves here. Ah, cat hair. Oh my gosh. Rigby, what have you been doing over here? There we go. He pointed to a low black door at the opposite side of the hall. I crossed over, rapped somewhat loudly, and went in without waiting for an invitation. A huge, white-haired old man rose from a table covered with, covered with books and papers and confronted me sternly. Who are you? said he. How came you here? What do you want? James Murray, barrister at law, on foot across the moor, meat, drink, and sleep. He bent his bushy brows into a portentous frown. 
Mine is not a house of entertainment, he said haughtily. Jacob, how dare you admit this stranger? I didn't admit him, grumbled the old man. He followed me over the moor and showed his way in before me. I'm no match for six foot two. And pray, sir, by what right have you forced an entrance into my house? The same by which I should have clung to your boats, sir, if I were drowning the right of self-preservation. Self-preservation. There's an inch of snow on the ground already, I replied briefly, and it will be deep enough to cover my body before daybreak. He strode to the window, pulled aside a heavy black curtain, and looked out. It is true, he said. You can stay, if you choose, till morning. Jacob, serve the supper. With this he waved me to a seat, resumed his own, and became at once absorbed in the studies from which I had disturbed him. I placed my gun in a corner, drew a chair to the hearth, and examined my quarters at leisure. Smaller and less incongruous in its arrangements than the hall, this room contained, nevertheless, much to awaken my curiosity. The floor was carpetless. The whitewashed walls were in part scrawled over with strange diagrams, and in others covered with shelves crowded with philosophical instruments, the uses of the uses of many of which were unknown to me. On one side of the fireplace stood a bookcase filled with dingy folios, on the other a small organ, fantastically decorated with painted carvings of medieval saints and devils. Through the half-open door of a cupboard at the further end of the room, I saw a long array of geological specimens, surgical preparations, crucibles, retorts, and jars of chemicals, while on the mantel shelf beside me, amid a small number, amid a number of small objects, stood a model of the solar system, a small galvanic battery, and a microscope. Each chair had its burden. Every corner was heaped high with books. The very floor was littered over with maps, casts, papers, tracings, and, lear and learned lumber of all conceivable kinds. I stared about me with an amazement increased by every fresh object upon which my eyes chanced to rest. So strange a room I had never seen, yet seemed it stranger still to find such a room in a lone farmhouse amid the wild and solitary moors. Over and over again I looked from my host to his surroundings, and from his surroundings back to my host, asking myself who and what could he be? His head was singularly fine, but it was more than the head of a poet, but it was more the head of a poet than a philosopher, broad in the temples, prominent over the eyes, and clothed with a rough profusion of perfectly white hair. It had all the ideality and much of the ruggedness that characteristics that characterizes the head of Louis von Beethoven. There were the same deep lines about the mouth and the same stern furrows in the brow. It was the same concentration of expression. A little bit of phrenology there for anybody who's, uh, who's listening. While well, I was yet observing him, the door opened, and Jacob brought in the supper. His master then closed his book, rose, and with more courtesy of manner than he had yet shown, invited me to the table. A dish of ham and eggs, a loaf of brown bread, and a bottle of admirable sherry were placed in front of me. I have but the homeliest farmhouse fare to offer you, sir, said my entertainer. Your appetite, I trust, will make up for the deficiencies of our larder. I had already fallen upon the viands and now protested, with the enthusiasm of a starving sportsman, that I had never eaten anything so delicious. Hunger makes good sauce. He bowed stiffly and sat down to his own supper, which consisted, primitively, of a jug of milk and a basin of porridge. We ate in silence, and when we had done, Jacob removed the tray. I then drew my chair back to the fireside. My host, somewhat to my surprise, did the same, and turning abruptly towards me said, Sir, I have lived here in strict retirement for three and twenty years. During that time, I have not seen as many strange faces, and I have not read a single newspaper. You are the first stranger who has crossed my threshold for more than four years. Will you favor me with a few words of information 
respecting the outer world from which I have parted company so long. Pray interrogate me, I replied. I am heartily at your service. He bent his head in acknowledgement, leaned forward with his elbows resting on his knees and his chin supported in the palms of his hands, stared fixedly into the fire and proceeded to question me. His inquiries related chiefly to scientific matters, with the latter with the latter progress of which, as applied to the practical purposes of life, he was almost wholly unacquainted. No student of science myself, I replied it as well as my slight information permitted, but the task was far from easy, and I was much relieved when, passing from interrogation to discussion, he began pouring forth his own conclusions upon the facts which I had been attempting to place before him. He talked, and I listened, spellbound. He talked till I believe he almost forgot my presence, and only thought aloud. I had never heard anything like it then. I had never heard anything like it since. Familiar with all the systems of all philosophies, subtle in analysis, bold in generalization, he poured forth his thoughts in an uninterrupted stream, and, still leaning forward in the same moody attitude with his eyes fixed upon the fire, wandered from topic to topic, from speculation to speculation, like an inspired dreamer, from practical science to mental philosophy, from electricity in the wire to electricity in the nerve, from, wa from Watts to Mesmer, from Mesmer to Reichenbach, from Reichenbach to Swedenborg, Spinoza, Condillac, Descartes, Berkeley, Aristotle, Plato, and the Magi and the mystics of the East were transitioned which, however bewilderingly in their variety and scope, seemed easy and harmonious upon his lips as sequences in music. By and by, I forgot now by what link of conjecture or illustration, he passed on to that field which lies beyond the boundary line of even conject conjectural philosophy and reaches no man knows whither. He spoke of the soul and its aspirations of the spirit and its powers, of second sight, of prophecy, of those phenomena which, under the names of ghosts, specters, and supernatural appearances, have been denied by the skeptics and attested by the credulous of all ages. The world, he said, grows hourly more and more skeptical of all that lies beyond its narrow radius, and our men of science foster the fatal tendency. They condemn as fable all that rests, all that resists experiment. They reject as false all that cannot be brought to the test of the laboratory or the dissecting room. Against what superstition have they waged so long and obstinate a war as the belief in apparitions? And yet what superstition has maintained its hold upon the minds of men so long and so firmly? Show me any facts in physics, in history, in archaeology, which is supported by testimony so wide and so various attested by all races of men in all ages and in all climates by the soberest sages of antiquity, by the rudest savage of today, by the Christian, the pagan, the pantheist, the materialist. This phenomenon is treated as a nursery tale by the philosophers of our century. Circumstantial evidence weighs with them as a feather in the balance. The comparison of causes with effects, however, valuable in, so in physical science is put aside as worthless and unreliable. The evidence of competent witnesses, however conclusive in a court of justice, counts for nothing. He who pauses before he pronounces is condemned as a trifler. He who believes is a dreamer or a fool. He spoke with bitterness and, having said this, relapsed for some minutes into silence. Presently he raised his head from his hands and added, with an altered voice and manner, I, sir, paused, investigated, believed, and was not ashamed to state my convictions to the world. I, too, was branded as a visionary, held up to ridicule by my contemporaries, and hooted from that field of silence in which I had labored with honor during all the best years of my life. These things happened just three and twenty years ago. Since then, I have lived as you see me living now, and the world has forgotten me as I have forgotten the world. You have my history. 
It is a very sad one, I murmured, scarcely, scarcely knowing what to answer. It is a very common one, he replied. I have only suffered for the truth, as many a better and wiser man has suffered before me. He rose as if desirous of ending the conversation and went over to the window. It has ceased snowing, he observed as he dropped the curtain and came back to the fireside. Ceased, I exclaimed, starting eagerly to my feet. Oh, if it were only possible, but no, it is hopeless. Even, I could, even if I could find my way across the moor, I could not walk twenty miles tonight. Walk twenty miles tonight, replied my ho host. What are you thinking of? Of my wife, I replied impatiently, of my young wife, who does not know that I have lost my way, and who is at this moment breaking her heart with suspense and terror. Where is she? At Walding, twenty miles away. At Walding, he echoed thoughtfully. Yes, the distance, it is true, is twenty miles. But are you so very anxious to save the next six or eight hours? So very, very anxious that I would give ten guineas at this moment for a guide and a horse. Your wish can be gratified at a less costly rate, said he, smiling. The night mail from the north, which changes horses at Walding, passes within five miles of this spot and will be due at a certain crossroad in about an hour and a quarter. If Jacob were to go with you across the moor and put you into the old coach road, you might find your way, I suppose, to where it joins the new one. Easily, gladly. He smiled again, rang the bell, gave the old servant his directions, and taking a bottle of whiskey and a wine glass from the cupboard in which he kept his chemicals. I feel like you shouldn't keep those two things together. Like, from what I know about labs, particularly chemical, chemistry-related labs, you, you shouldn't keep, like, food and beverage and stuff that is safe to consume, like, in with all the toxic shit. Like, I'm pretty sure that's a health and safety rule. The snow lies deep, and it will be difficult walking tonight on the moor. A glass of, oh my god, I don't know how to say that word. A glass of Uzbek, Uzbek, before you start. All right, just rearranging myself a little bit here. I would have declined the spirit, but he pressed it on me, and I drank it. Wait, did he just drink a wine glass full of whiskey? I mean, Victorian wine glasses were smaller, but still, <laughs> that's a lot. It went down my throat like liquid flame. Yeah, I bet and almost took my breath away. It is strong, he said, but it will help keep out the cold. And now you have no moments to spare. Good night. I thanked him for his hospitality and would have shaken hands, but that he turned away before I could finish my sentence. In another minute, I had traversed the hall. Jacob had locked the outer door behind me, and we were out on the wide white moor. Although the wind had fallen, it was still bitterly cold. Not a star glimmered in the black vault overhead. Not a sound, save the rapid crunching of the snow beneath our feet, disturbed the heavy stillness of the night. Jacob, not too well pleased with his mission, shambled on before in sullen silence, his lantern in his, lantern in his hand and his shadow at his feet. I followed with my gun over my shoulder, as little inclined for conversation as himself. His eloquence yet held my imagination captive. I remembered to this day, with surprise, how my overexcited brain retained whole sentences and parts of sentences, troops of brilliant images and fragments of splendid reasoning, in the very words in which he had uttered them. Musing thus over what I had heard, and striving to recall a lost link here and there, I strode on at the heels of my guide, absorb, observe, laugh, I strode on at the heels of my guide, absorbed and unobservant. Presently, at the end, as it seemed to me of only a few minutes, he came to a sudden halt and said, Yon's your road. Keep the stone fence to your right hand, and you can't fail of the way. This, then, is the old coach road. Aye, tis the old coach road. And how far do I go before I reach the crossroads? Nigh upon three mile. I pulled out my purse, and he became more communicative. 
"'The road's a fair road enough,' said he, "'for foot passengers, but was over steep and narrow for the northern traffic. "'You'll mind where the parapet's broken away, close again at the signpost. "'It's never been mended since the accident.' "'What, what accident?' "'Eh, the night mail pitched right over into the valley below. "'A guide fifty, f a good fifty feet and more, "'just at the worst bit of road in the whole country. "'Horrible. Were many lives lost?' All four were found dead, and t'other two tied died the next morning. How long is it since this happened? Just nine years. Near the signpost, you say. I will bear it in mind. Good night. Good night, sir, and thank ye. Jacob pocketed his half crown, his half crown, and made a fair pretense of touching his hat, and trudged back by the way he had come. I watched the light of his lantern till it quite disappeared, and then turned to pursue my way alone. And that is where we will leave the first half of The Phantom, the Phantom Coach by Amelia Edwards. So he's been put onto the right road to find the, the mail coach that is meant to intercept him and take him home. So I hope you have enjoyed. I hope um, attempting to do some kind of voices for the, for the other characters was uh, a little helpful and interesting. Comment below uh, how, that, uh, how that worked for you, if it did, if it didn't. And as I said at the start, please like, subscribe, comment, share the video around so that other people can uh, meet these really cool authors and these great stories. <coughs> Pardon me, a bit of a bit of a tickle in my throat there. And thank you for spending some time with me today. I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. And please join me here again soon for the conclusion of The Phantom Coach by Amelia Edwards.